This is the panel about lessons from Latin America, and we are very pleased to have a really great panel here. Um, we have as our first speaker, Professor Cristobal Rovira Kaltwasser from the Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. He has done a ton of very interesting work and really pushed the agenda of populism studies forward. He is the lead editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook on Populism that is an absolute must if you're interested in that topic and gives a comprehensive overview. It'll, it'll come out in December, right? December? Yes, November. Yeah. November. November, November, okay. So then we are having Professor Kenneth Roberts from Cornell University. He's the Richard Schwartz Professor of Government there. And he has published very widely on Latin American politics, including his great book changing course in Latin America about the party systems um, that came out from Cambridge in 2014. And are, he has also done work on populism for a long time. The two of us kind of concocted this whole thing about neoliberal populism in the 1990s and got a lot of heat for it, which is what you want because that draws attention, right? So don't be shy. <laughs> anyway, so we benefited from that. Then, as discussants, we are having Caitlin Andrews, who is an advanced PhD student in the government department here. She's doing a great dissertation on charismatic populist leadership in Venezuela and Argentina and knows everything about Hugo Chavez and the Kirchner's and Mannerman. And then our second discussant is Professor Jonathan Brown from the history department here, who has um, published a number of books, including what just came out, Cuba's Revolutionary World from Harvard University Press, a massive, very well-researched book. And I'm um, especially, he has been broadly interested, but especially specialist on Argentina. And I, I can't not mention it, that I learned about Perón from him when I was a student here 32 years ago, and I took his great class on Argentine history in the 19th in 20th century, so it's a special pleasure to be able to introduce. You don't have him. to mention how long ago it was. <laughs> that, says, that says more about it's me. Fresh. I mean, you, you know, for you, that doesn't say very much. But for me, I mean, look at all those wrinkles. So anyway, no problem. So let's start with. Can oh. I say this yeah, very sure. short? I'm so sorry to interrupt. I have a very short announcement. For those of you who want to join this virtual discussion, please use the hashtag UPPopulism. And if you're watching live stream, we have 250 people watching. We've asked, so that we have time for questions, we've asked the speakers to present their papers maximum 15 minutes, and then the discussions to go for maximum 10 minutes. And then we'll have ample time for discussion and debate. Thanks. So, Christopher. Thank you very much, Kurt, for the presentation, and also thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy about being here and talking about the case of Trump, although I'm not an expert on US American politics. So I have been working a lot on populism in the last few years, most of my work I have written with a good friend and colleague of mine whose name is Cas Mude. So, and what I'm going to present today is trying to think about Latin American cases. And I will try to show you to what extent the experiences from Latin America can help us to understand what probably might happen in the United States. That being said, I'm very skeptical about doing predictions, but Kurt was saying that's what you need to do, so I will try to show which are my predictions in only nine months that Trump has been in power. So roughly about the, the outline of my presentation, which is the outline of the paper, I will talk about the three waves of populism in Latin America. And I will try to focus not on too many details, but that, uh, mainly about which have been the main strategies for dealing with populist actors in Latin America in each of those waves, so to say. And then finally, I will go to the case of Donald Trump, which again, I'm a bit more reluctant, but because Kurt has pushed me, I will try to say something about that. And of course, I will finalize with some uh, brief remarks. So uh, let's go then directly to the first issue, and this is uh, dealing with the first wave of populism in, in Latin America. As you probably know, there is a lot of literature about populism in Latin America, and most of this literature started with the first wave of populism. So the typical examples of there, of course, is Juan Domingo Perón in Argentina, but there are a couple of others that are also very common in Latin America. Think, for example, about Getulio Vargas, or also uh, some 
cases in Chile, like Alessandri, for example, or later on also um, different uh, presidents that came to power in different countries in Latin America. So what we do know is that the rise of the first wave of populism in Latin America was related to a crisis of going back to the argument of court. And this is mainly the Great Repression, but the long-term consequences of the Great Repression, which were a crisis of incorporation in Latin America. And because of this crisis of incorporation, we saw the rise of populist personalist leaders. And I put that in red here because uh, in Latin America, it's normally the case that populism, it's used as a discourse by personalist leaders. But I think this is a Latin American story. We will hear later on about the European cases. And in Europe, it's much more political parties that are using the populist rhetoric. And this is a key issue because when we are talking about Trump, it's a bit tricky. Because he's a populist, and we can say that he's a populist personalist leader, but he has the support of a strong political party. So and that makes the case of the United States different to many of the cases that we know in Latin America. What we also know, if we think about the first wave of populism in Latin America, is that, du that, dur that during that period of time, democratic regimes were relatively weak, and the military played a key role. So to say democracy was not completely consolidated, and because of that, you have like a lot of internal struggles, sometimes between elites, but also between masses and elites, and the military was one of the key actors that played a key role. I think that this is important to take into account because democracy to a certain extent, and here I'm quoting a famous argument of Guillermo O'Donnell, was an impossible game. O'Donnell's argument is about what happened in Argentina when Perón came to power, but my impression is that democracy was an impossible game in Argentina and also in other Latin American countries. What is interesting about this argument is that democracy was an impossible game in Argentina and in other countries, and this connects a bit with the argument of Steve, what he was saying before, is because some uh, prerequisites for the consolidation of democracy were not present in Latin America. And I'm thinking here mainly about legitimacy, whether elites believe that the rules of the game should be the democratic rules of the game. And because this was not the case, what happened very, uh, very often in Latin America during that period of time is that oppositional forces used non-democratic means to combat populism. For example, try to mobilize the military and orchestrate a coup d'etat, or also what happens in the case of Argentina that some leaders of the opposition try to implement militant democratic measures. I put militant democratic measures then in quotations because it's a very tricky interpretation of that. The idea, the idea was to ban the Peronist party. And of course, that generated a lot of tensions within the country and didn't help to uh, boost democratic consolidation. So if we think about the second wave of populism in Latin America, the story is a bit different here because we are talking about a period of time uh, that is connected to the transition to democracy during the 1990s. And during that period of time, we saw the appearance of populist personalist leader again in only a very few countries of Latin America. And again, we are talking here about populist personalist leaders rather than parties. So the two examples that I'm going to put a bit more of emphasis are the cases of Alberto Fujimori in Peru and Color de Melo in Brazil. And I think the contrast is pretty interesting because Color de Melo was unsuccessful. In fact, there was an impeachment against him, and before the, the impeachment came to place, he decided to resign, and he was only two years in power. Fujimori is the opposite because he was very successful, and in fact, he ended up building a competitive authoritarian regime, and he stayed for 10 years in Peru. So doing the contrast might help us to understand why is it that in certain circumstances a populist leader might be able to stay in power for a long period of time, and in the other case, this is not happened. So if we think about Alberto Fujimori in Peru, he was a clear example of a political outsider who didn't have a strong political party behind him, and he didn't make an effort to build a political party. This is crucial, and we will see later on with Chavez that this is a big difference. In fact, for each of the elections that Fujimori contested three elections in the 1990s, he built a new political party. And in fact, the, the political party was non-existent. It was just a machine controlled by himself. What we also know in the case of Fujimori, and this is the reason why he was able to stay for a long period of time in power, is because he was able to build a coalition of support at the elite level and at the mass level. So the coalition of support at the elite level was related to a certain extent to the support of the business community that was keen on the implementation of neoliberal reforms and also because he established an alliance with the military 
who, and they got, in fact, a lot of money for fighting against the Shining Path guerrilla movement. And at the same time, we know that at the mass level, he was very successful, in part because of the reforms that he implemented. He was able to control hyperinflation. He assumed a country that had a level of inflation of 10,000%, and after one year, it, gone, it went to zero. And at the same time, he was very successful in dealing against the Shining Path guerrilla movement. And because of that, the approval ratings went really high. Also, what we know is that the opposition was extremely weak, was very divided. To a certain extent, was some sections of the opposition started to support Fujimori. But the argument that I think it's important to take into account, and this is not my argument, it's an argument of Steve Levitsky, I would say, that he puts in his book with Luke and Wei, is that when you have competitive authoritarian regimes, growing outside pressure can play a huge role. And in fact, one of the reasons why Fujimori was not able to stay for a longer period of time, I would say it's not the only factor, but one of the key factors is because international pressure started to be way too high against the regime. And in fact, it's a long story, but he had to resign being in Japan. And then you had like a transition again to a sort of a electoral democracy afterwards. So let's present the second case, which is an unsuc unsuccessful case. And this is Color de Melo in Brazil. Funnily enough, Color de Melo is not really a political outsider. He has been playing in the political game in Brazil since a long period of time. That's the reason that I will call him much more a political maverick. But he didn't have the support of a strong party behind him. And in fact, to understand why is it that he won the election is related a bit to the polarization that the country was experiencing at that period of time. Lula da Silva was the main competitor at that time. But Lula da Silva was really, really on the left, different than the Lula that came to power in the year 2000. What it's interesting to take into account, and this is the difference with Fujimori, is that Color de Mello was not able to craft a coalition of support. First of all, at the elite level, he started to govern by decree, and this generated a lot of tension within the conservative sectors of the, of the Congress. And at the mass levels, we know that the approval ratings started to go down. And because of that, he didn't have like, people that were supporting him. So then there was an impeachment process, as I mentioned before. He had to resign before uh, he was impeached by Congress. So let's go then to, finally, to the third and last wave of populism in Latin America. What we know is that the, since the year 2000s, we have seen the rise of different types of populist forces in Latin America. And normally, we identify what we call the populist left. But even within the populist left, there are some differences. And I want to go into briefly in some of these details. So Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is the obvious case. This is an example of a political outsider, pretty important to take into account. He was able to build a new political party. And this is a political party that is relatively strong at the organizational level, completely different to the case of Fujimori. But also, we have to take into account that the opposition played a very bad game at the beginning. And this helped for the radicalization of the Chavista project. I don't know if you're aware of, but the opposition tried, in fact, to orchestrate a coup d'etat against Chavez, and then a general strike. And because of that, Chavez, smart enough, said, I need to use all the mechanisms that I have at hand for staying in power. I'm not saying with this sentence that Chavez was a Democrat, but because the others were playing the anti-democratic rules, then that boosted a sort of a impossible game, to use the words of O'Donnell. At the same time, Hugo Chavez was able to build a coalition of support at the elite level, mainly because of the military, but not only. Some business communities at the beginning sectors of the business community were uh, sponsoring him, and also at the mass level, mainly because of clientelism, and at the same time, because growing welfare expenditure. Nowadays, we know that there is something called the Democratic Unity Roundtable that is trying to develop a much more democratic approach against Chavismo. And we also know that outside pressure is increasing, but it's still an open question how the regime is going to evolve, whether it's going to stay as a competitive authoritarian regime or not. If we go to Rafael Correa in Ecuador, this is what I would call a political maverick. He's not a completely outsider. In fact, he was a minister in the previous government. But also similar to the case of Fujimori, he didn't have support of a strong party, and he didn't put much effort in building a political party. He has been able to build a coalition of support at the elite level, mainly because of the business community, and also at the mass level because of clientelism and the commodity boom that helped him to use a lot of public spending. But we also know that the opposition has been relatively weak, mainly because of these carrot and stick measures of Correismo. But 
The other aspect that it's important to take into account is that the commodity boom has come to an end. And nowadays, we see growing tensions within Correismo. In fact, Correa didn't run as the candidate. And now we have a new president. And this is all the internal factions within Correismo. And in this sense, my feeling is it's a less threatening scenario than the case of Venezuela. Finally, let's go to the case of Evo Morales in Bolivia, which, in my opinion, is the most interesting one. Evo Morales is not an outsider. He's a political activist who has been able to build a very strong political party, the movement towards socialism. And this is a party that has very strong grassroots organizations. So the success of Evo Morales is related to what Raul Madrid calls ethnopopulism. So this is a strategy that has helped him to construct a coalition of support at the elite level with some sectors of the military, with some sectors of the business community, but also very strong at the mass level. But what is also interesting is that in the case of Evo Morales, there are sort of internal checks and balances. Evo Morales is a personalist leader, but at the same time, there are strong grassroots organizations, and there is a strong party. So it might be that Evo Morales says, I want to do this, but there are these sort of internal checks and balances that moderates the power of the president. And this is the reason why I would say that this is the example that is the less authoritarian of the three examples of the current wave of populism in Latin America. So let me then finalize with going to Trump. To what extent the lessons that I have tried to show you here are useful for explaining the case of Donald Trump or not? First of all, let me address three important differences between the case of Trump and Latin America. And this is related to the previous discussion. The first one is that, in my opinion, Trump is not really an insider, but he's not really an outsider. I will call him rather an amateur. I'm calling here the, the paper of uh, Carreras, in which he makes all this distinction. But what is interesting is that he's an amateur that has been nominated by the Republican Party. This is completely different from the Latin American scenario. Fujimori built his new party from the beginning. He didn't care about the party. But much of the power of Trump, it's related to the Republican Party. And this is very different to the Latin American experiences. The second issue that we already mentioned is that in the case of the US, we have a two-party system that is very entrenched. And this is very different to many of the Latin American countries that have seen the rise of populism. But it's a system that is highly polarized. And as we have been discussing before, I think that this is one of the biggest issues and problems of US American democracy. And finally, we also know that the US is a presidential system with very strong checks and balances. And this is, to a certain extent, a difference with Latin America. But Danny Brinks also told us before, well, many checks and balances, but. So there are some issues with that sort of argument. So which are then the lessons from Latin America? So the first one is that my impression is that Trump has been able to build a relatively strong coalition of support at the mass level. And this is in part because of polarization and in part because of populist rhetoric. So these are Trump's approval rating since he came to power. If you see, the blue line is among Republicans. So there is almost no variation. So it's roughly 80 to 85% of Republicans support the president. And this is -import, very important for him, because as we were saying before, it might be that the elite within the Republican is again the president. But imagine you're a senator, and you will say, I will do an impeachment. The base is going to rebel against you. So this is one of the reasons why Trump might be able to stay longer in power because of the approval ratings. But it's an open question whether it's going to stay like this. But the key issue is approval ratings in the US, if you follow the work of some US scholars, they would say it's driven by polarization. If you're a Republican, you will approve the president. That's it, no matter what he does or he doesn't do. The second issue, and this is a tricky part, is that the coalition of support at the elite level is, I think, the damaging scenario for Trump. And this is because the growing tension within the Republican Party, but also with the business community. To a certain extent, he's alienating certain sectors of the business community because he has like these dubious stances on the free market. And finally, I think that the Democratic Party, in my impression, it's very divided. It hasn't developed a clear strategy about how to deal with, with him. My impression is I, don't, I know that the US is different, and past presidents don't play a big role. But I think the key actor should be Obama. If Obama will, Obama will build the Obama Foundation and would say there is a big threat to the contemporary world that it's populism at this sort of radical right, he's the best candidate to do that. But he's very, very silent. And finally, also, we have seen also that the media and civil society organizations have been playing a big role. But again, think about the issue of polarization. I mean, the media, 
that normally most people in this room read and use, it's completely different than the media that the supporters of Trump read. And also the issue of mobilizing voters will be like a very specific segment of the electorate. I'm running out of time, so I leave it here. Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Ken is going to do that for me. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to be here and participate in this workshop. It's uh, obviously a invigorating and uh, not, not an entirely uplifting debate, but it uh, is one that is intellectually fascinating. You know, I mean, Kurt mentioned that he and I conspired uh, sort of rethinking populism way back, I, I, I think, uh, you know, this is way back in the early 1990s. And at, at the time that we did that, populism was, was non-existent as a topic in the academic world. If you would have told me, and I, I think we, I, we first had a conversation around this at a lunch counter in Santiago, Chile, when we were, he was talking about what he was finding in Brazil, and I was talking about what I'd seen with Peru and Fujimori, and Kurt decided to organize this conference on new populisms. And so we had a, an APSA conference. Um, we, our panel was 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. I think there were three or four people in the audience, mostly former grad student colleagues of us. Nobody had, was paying any attention to it. If you would have told me at that time that we were going to have a workshop here to talk about the populist transformation of American democracy and what does it mean for American democracy, I would have thought it inconceivable. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, I, I was having dinner uh, a year or two ago with Raul in, in New Orleans, and I remember joking to him that this was all Kurt's fault because he organized this panel that helped resurrect the, the topic of, of populism in, this, in political science. But anyway, I have to confess, I'm not sure that I wrote the, the paper that I was assigned to write. I, I'm not very good at following assignments. I ended up talking more about Trump and the U.S. in the paper than I did about Latin America. Um, but I, in, in a part, that's because I'm, I'm fascinated by what I think are the peculiarities of uh, the U.S. case as a, as a, a populist phenomenon. Um, and, you know, and, and then thinking in terms of what are the consequences for American democracy of this rise of populism. Clearly, there are a lot of things about the U.S. that are that are quite distinctive for thinking about populism and democracy. Uh, let me most obviously perhaps, um, democracy has never broken down in a country as wealthy as the United States. It would be unprecedented if the United States were to have a democratic breakdown. I don't think we're gonna have a democratic breakdown. What I think is a much more viable possibility is some sort of democratic erosion in the direction of competitive authoritarianism along the lines of what Steve has, has worked on in, in other works. Um, but that has never happened in a country as wealthy as the United States, and it, is, it has never happened in a country with a democratic regime that has been in place for 230-something years and has had hundreds of years to fine-tune and <coughs> correct and make adjustments and cultivate what are supposed to be democratic, the kinds of democratic norms that sustain the institutions that, that Steve was talking about before. So a significant democratic erosion in the United States, if it does happen, uh, I think would be unprecedented. But what I think is, is really interesting in terms of the peculiarities of the US case for me to think about, it has to do with the nature of the relationship between Trump as a populist figure and the Republican Party. And some of this has already been, been alluded to by, uh, by Cristobal and, and others. Um, but ultimately, I think that uh, you know, Trump is not in a situation uh, of some of the classic Latin American populists in recent times, from Fujimori to Chavez, the other Bolivarian cases. We're not in a context of a complete crisis um, as Kurt mentioned, the kind of crisis where the party system gets wiped out by the rise of a populist figure. All right? Trump is arising in a situation where not only are the, are the democratic institutions uh, highly established and institutionalized, but you also have a party system that is very much intact. And so Trump has to operate within the constraints uh, of this particular party system. Um, however, unlike Kurt, I guess, I'm a little bit less sanguine about what the, what the presence of the Republican Party really means uh, for restraining Trump. Um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit more. And I think that ultimately, uh, 
My sense is that we can't really think or we shouldn't really think of the Republican Party as a mainstream conservative party at this point in its development. Um, and I believe that the democratic vocation of the Republican Party is in question uh, at this point in time. And I think the reason is because the Republican Party, I would argue, um, has ultimately become what, I, what you might call a movement party, or perhaps is a better term, a party of movements. And in a sense, it has, it has reversed the normal path of political evolution in parties. Right? A lot of work talks about how parties may be born as movements, but then they evolve into more professionalized, bureaucratized uh, kinds of political establishments. And the Republican Party, in a sense, followed that path. We forget the Republican Party was born in the abolitionist movement in the 1850s. So it began as a movement, turned into a political party, quickly transformed itself into a party of the establishment for 150 years. What's fascinating, I think, is the party, I would argue, has now gone full circle. And it has returned to being a movement party, uh, albeit a radically different kind of movements than what it started out with in the 1850s. In fact, the exact opposite. Uh, and I would argue that it's not a movement party. I think it is a, a party of movements. And I think there are, are three principal movement currents uh, that control at least the grassroots of the Republican Party. Right? There's an ethno-nationalist current that Trump clearly represents. There is a market fundamentalist current that he absolutely does not well represent, but has gotten on board with him for the most part. Uh, and there's a Christian evangelical current. Uh, the uh, also does not come from that background, but they have gotten on board as well. And I think part of what we see is a, is a remarkable ability of Trump. This is sort of the classic populism. I think Trump is, in a sense, uh, sort of the, the, the classic empty signifier, a figure with relative, relatively little ideological and programmatic content of his own. But he is, it is a figure that these different currents can get on board behind and try to stamp their own agenda onto, that, uh, onto to his particular leadership and try to advance their agendas through his political leadership. Uh, so I think that ultimately this transformation of the Republican Party is, is important for trying to understand where we are. And other things then in terms of what's distinctive about this, this particular experience. Um, first of all, as Cristobal was saying, you know, most of the recent Latin American populists that you see, they, they construct their own political party. They emerge in a context where the party system is in crisis, uh, and they construct their own political party. Uh, the, the takeover of a mainstream political party by this kind of populist outsider leadership is extremely rare in comparative terms. It's also very unusual, I think, the context in which it arises. When we think about the rise of recent populisms in Latin America or in Southern Europe, typically it's not in a context where you have very strong political parties that are highly polarized and you have very strong partisan identities. Typically it's the exact opposite, right? The standard, the standard environment, context in which, party, in which populists emerge is one where you have some sort of convergence of the mainstream political parties. They converge programmatically as Latin American party systems did in the 1980s and 1990s around the neoliberal model. And you get populisms emerging to contest that from outside the party system in a context of, of programmatic convergence of mainstream parties. Very similar in Southern Europe in recent times where you see the rise of Syriza and Podemos in context where the traditional parties of the left were implementing austerity and adjustment programs. So when the mainstream converges and basically becomes indistinguishable, right, that's when you get populism emerging to contest the issues that have been left aside uh, and have been neglected or to give voice to groups within society that have been left outside. What's amazing about Trump is, in fact, you're getting the rise of this kind of outsider leadership in a context where the parties are highly polarized. In fact, where partisan identities have increased in the United States, partisanship has strengthened, right? The party organizations, as Steve was alluding to, uh, I think the Republican Party as a professional organization has lost control of the basis, and so the organization may be weak, but I think partisanship is very strong, and in particular, negative partisanship is even stronger, right? There are a lot of people who may be rather relatively lukewarm Democrats or Republicans, but they're intense anti-Democrats or anti-Republicans. So the negative partisanship against the other side is stronger than the kinds of appeal that they feel for their given political party. All right, so the rise of this kind of populist outsider leadership in a context uh, of acute polarization is, in fact, quite unusual. 
Um, just a, a couple of other points I wanted to make about you know, the things that, that stamp what's unusual here. The ethno-nationalist component of this phenomenon um, is something that we really have not seen in Latin America. Right? So Trump's populist leadership looks similar to a lot of the, the kinds of leaderships we see. But the ethno-national component of this is quite, un, you know, it's just not something you, you get in Latin America. I have great fears that it's brewing in Brazil, and I'm really worried about that. Um, but ultimately, this is a different kind of populism. In that sense, it is more similar to what you see in the European context. And I also think the fact that Trump has to work with, you know, through a party organization makes this much more a case like what you see in Eastern Europe. Some of the cases we'll talk about this afternoon, countries like Hungary and Poland, where you get uh, a populist figure coming into power with a political party, uh, and a party that then proceeds to go about uh, whittling away at the democratic checks and balances. So what I want to really talk about the last few minutes then is, you know, what is it about the Republican Party and this intense partisan polarization that I think is a real challenge to the democratic checks and balances? I think we need to remember that the theoretical development about democratic checks and balances, you know, Montesquieu and, and Madison, this, this work was done before the rise of mass politics, but indeed before the rise of party politics. You did not have political parties. So in the context of, of absolute monarchies, creating other institutions so that you could disperse and fragment political power, just creating those institutions provided a measure of checks and balances. They wrote before you had party organizations and the possibility that political parties could come into power and through their hold on certain institutions, then tr proceed to, you know, to colonize or to occupy other institutions and, and basically repurpose those institutions so that they don't function as checks and balances. And I would argue, Steve alluded to this point, I think we should not think of checks and balances as somehow being institutionally crafted so that they inevitably function as checks and balances. The exact same institutions can be repurposed uh, if there is a party that controls enough levers uh, and it is, it is a party that has autocratic tendencies. Um, and so my great fear, is, as Dan Brinks was talking about, the, poss the possibility of, re of, of stacking the Supreme Court for a generation to come, uh, I think that is very likely to take, to take place. The implications of that uh, for voter, the, whether or not you would have judicial constraints on efforts to manipulate uh, the electorate um, and you know, possibilities of voter suppression that would be skewed towards certain sectors of the electorate. Um, the, the ability of, of the Republican Party, they're now, they control almost enough uh, state legislatures to where in theory they could move towards you know, proposing constitutional amendments. Uh, to the United States. Um, so ultimately, although I think we're, like I said, I don't think we're in the ball game of sort of a Bolivarian plebiscitary transformation of, uh, of the American democratic system, it's not that clear to me that we're not in the kind of situation like a Hungary or Poland where you get some sort of whittling away at the checks and balances and where in fact the, those institutional checks themselves become the focal point of contestation and control over them. And so the erosion of the norms of, of forbearance and tolerance that Steve was talking about um, become a very critical part of, of this story. So I have a great, a great deal of concern then about how these democratic checks and balances will function in a context uh, where a party has, has basically you know, come into office that I think that it really has very tenuous kinds of commitments uh, to those particular norms. Um, what's interesting then in thinking about Trump and the Republican Party is, as I said, you know, so you have these different currents that exist within the Republican Party, and Trump himself does, does not really provide effective representation for some of these ideological currents. But whether or not they stay on board raises important questions about you know, whether or not Trump continues to serve certain interests of the party, the ideological agendas and the partisan agendas that, that are in place. Um, at this point, as, as, as the data shows that Cristobal pointed out, uh, the, the Republican Party base has remained remarkably loyal uh, to Donald Trump. Um, and so I think how this plays out and what the ultimate impact of his administration is on American democracy, it really depends a lot 
on this ongoing relationship between Trump and the Republican Party. And at the end of my paper, I sketch out a couple of different scenarios for how this could play out. One scenario is what I call a populist bandwagoning, where Trump, as the empty signifier, continues to provide a vehicle for these different currents to, to rally behind and to use and to, to, to stamp their, their own agenda onto his administration. I think if that, if that um, agenda plays out, uh, American democracy you know, really confronts significant challenges in the years ahead. I think that is most likely in the context of some sort of domestic or, or international crisis. I should point out, in thinking about the possibilities, uh, the, the impact of a crisis, we should not only be thinking about terrorist attacks or some sort of international war or conflict, those are very obvious. We also have to think in terms of widespread social protest, and in particular, the possibility of violent social protest. And how does that transform the calculations and the identities of the different actors in play and the basis of, of the Trump administration. Uh, so there is, I've, I, I like to watch Fox News and read Breitbart to see what they're saying. It, they are you know, filled with stories about violent leftist protest, about the suppression of free speech in the academy. Um, they are arguing that there are other threats to democracy. And so talk about polarization. Uh, there, there are similar debates going on uh, on that side of the spectrum as well. The other scenarios that I sketch out very briefly, I talk about uh, sort of a populist containment, which is where elements of the Republican establishment would in fact, uh, in essence, they would have to abandon Trump and join uh, some of the Democrats in defending the checks and balances, essentially putting regime interests above the interests of the political party. I think that is certainly a possible scenario, uh, but I think the big challenge there is what does that mean in terms of the Republican basis and whether they're able to maintain support at the basis. And then finally, the, the other scenario that I sketch out is simply one of some sort of aborted populism where there's the possibility of scandal or impeachment uh, and the, the administration breaks down, but ultimately what does that mean in terms of the ongoing polarization and conflict between uh, the two parties. So just to conclude, um, I, you know, I made a point in my paper similar to what Steve was talking about, that I think the, the problems here go well beyond Trump himself and his populist leadership. I think that in, 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 in some ways his leadership is a reflection and an expression of the intense polarization that the country has gone through politically. Um, and the end of the Trump administration, I think, is unlikely to bring about um, an end to these democratic dysfunctions that we see. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for the, uh, thank you both, uh, Cristobal and Ken, for the opportunity to read and comment on your papers. I think that they're both really interesting and tie into some of the main points that we've been really discussing here from the very beginning with the, the introduction of the conference. Um, so I'll start with uh, Cristobal's paper. Um, so quickly to summarize, uh, to shed light on the surprising election of Donald Trump in November 2016, as well as the widespread concerns about his populist behaviors on the campaign trail and in office, Cristobal offers insights from Latin America, a region with unfortunately ample experience with populism, which as he describes unfolded in three waves, a wave of popular incorporation in the mid 20th century, a second free market wave in the 1990s, and a third more radical leftist wave in the 2000s. So by reviewing uh, various factors that contributed to the success and the demise of populist leaders in several countries across the three waves. He uh, covers a very impressive amount of uh, history and highlights numerous factors that could inform our understanding regarding the impact of Donald Trump's populism on democracy in the US. Um, I found the most uh, fascinating and the real crux of the paper uh, to be uh, this focus on, on populism and confronting pop populist leaders through the lens of the opposition and opposition strategy. Um, so uh, Cristobal asks, what are the most useful strategies available to the opposition for dealing with populism and avoiding the erosion of the liberal democratic regime? And to answer this question, 
involves three dimensions, which um, I mentioned a little bit later in the paper, but I want to kind of bring forward to the fore. Um, okay, so the first is the uh, extent to which the opposition embraces liberal democratic norms, right, and liberal democracy, and the context in which this takes place, right, which was very different, for example, in the mid-20th century. Uh, the second is phrased somewhat in terms of the populist leader themself, but themselves, but I want to turn it on its head uh, from the perspective of the opposition, and that is to what extent can the opposition maintain a cohesive unit to avoid being co-opted because populist leaders try to do, um, try to co cohere a, a, a a support base at two levels, at the mass level, but then also at the elite level. Uh, Perón, for example, was an expert at doing this in Argentina and co-opting elements of the main domestic political opposition, right, the radical party. And then finally, um, the opposition, and here I'm talking about the domestic political opposition, their ability to strategically interact with international actors and leverage the global context in order to place more pressure on populist leaders. Uh, so synthesizing insights from different Latin American experiences of populism, he then draws tentative lessons for opposing forces uh, to Donald Trump in the US to consider, while recognizing important characteristics that distinguish this case from its Latin American counterparts. So these lessons include, along those three dimensions, the need to embrace liberal democratic norms, uh, culti and then also on the third dimension, um, cultivating support among international actors to apply greater pressure to the populist leader. So um, we, I, I focus mostly on this, um, the, the clear opposition strategy framework that you present. Um, so it, it comes out, I think, most clearly in, in pages 18 to 19 of the paper, and I think that if it really uh, kind of drove the crux from the beginning, um, that might help really kind of structure your discussion of, of each of the cases, because it's really impressive what, what you cover in so many cases and so much history. And um, I think uh, given the focus of this on what kind of insights we have and if there is any hope for the opposition in the United States, um, the lessons that Latin American cases might have to share actually might come from that, um, that perspective which you present. Um, so my question for some of the cases is who is the opposition we're talking about and what is their role? This seems to defer across the cases. So, so it's clearly potentially the military in Argentina and in other mid 20th century cases, right? But then as um, I have mentioned before and as you mentioned, there, there is a domestic political opposition there as well with a, a fairly historical resolute commitment to democracy. Um, so um, I think maybe teasing out um, what the Radical Party was doing during, during Perón's um, rise to power and in that uh, his first administration before the, the coup and, and, and the outlawing of Peronism. Um, I, I wonder if some of those lessons and some of the negotiations and even some of the Radical Party's failures um, to resist and cohere against Biron uh, could be instructive for the US case. Um, so I also had, so I'll move on. Um, more, uh, let's see, I was also, so in, in some of your cases and, and in particular that second wave of populism with Peru and Fujimori, and Brazil and Color de Melo. Um, to, what uh, to what extent did the opposition even have a role? How much agency are we really talking about here? Um, so you really focus, and, and perhaps rightly so, on, on the leaders themselves, Fujimori for his unrelenting success, at least initially um, with hyperinflation, with, for better or worse, combating crime. Um, what, was the, what did the opposition look like, and why is it that they failed to stop his kind of bulldozing of the opposition of, in, in, of institutions? And, and uh, would that have, should we con be concerned about something like that in the case of Donald Trump? Um, perhaps not, is my, uh, is my hope. But, um, but then moving to Color de Melo, the opposition really had an active role. But what I was wondering in, in, in the section, is it because of Color's failures himself? So he initially 
um, managed to curb hyperinflation, but, but not for very long. And he also, he never really cultivated this hardcore mass support base. So at least according to a more mobilizational definition of populism, maybe he was even less populist to begin with. Um, so to what extent does, does the opposition really have an important strategic role? Does it depend on the global context? Or um, are we really at the mercy of the populist leader and the extent to which they themselves are talented and successful at leveraging these different strategies themselves? Um, then finally, on the, on the third dimension for this opposition strategy, you discuss a, a quite a bit in a lot of cases the role of international actors. Um, sometimes that is funneled through uh, their interaction with the domestic political opposition, but not always. And so it seems to me that it is up to the, the, the opposition, such as in the, the Venezuelan case, um, to, is to strategically engage with those actors. Um, certainly, it depends on the context and the relative power of, the, of the, the country with populism that we're talking about and the relative interests of global superpowers like the United States, for example. But, but that interaction is really important in terms of having insights for the US case. So certainly, it's going to be about that interaction between domestic opposition and international actors that we might have something to learn from here unless some international actors come and bulldoze regard, regardless of what the opposition constellation looks like here, which is probably unlikely. So especially, um, for example, with Color de Melo, um, with Correa, uh, with Fujimori at the end, maybe I, I'm curious what the interaction between those different actors looked like. Um, let's see, uh, the, the final piece I just wanted to conclude when you talk about um, the insights of this for, for Trump's populism in the United States. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating and disturbing the amount of partisan loyalty that was demonstrated for, for Donald Trump. Um, and so, so you emphasize the difference between organizational and personal populism here and this seems to be a demonstration of partisan loyalty more than personal loyalty. And um, so my question is, if loyalty is driven by party more than person, why haven't Republican leaders taken, since they, they don't really support Donald Trump in the first place, um, why aren't they able to kind of guide their party base into a different direction? Why are they at the mercy so much of Donald Trump because of his mass support base? To be fair, this is a puzzle that we're all struggling with, and I think um, some of the movement party aspects of, of Ken's paper and that we've discussed, uh, that Steve brought up before, are, are really helpful to, to looking into that. But I, I was left um, kind of wondering about that since you really laid that out so well. So I really enjoyed the paper. I think it emphasizes a number of important points about populism. Um, I think it has a lot um, of potential to really highlight the role that the opposition plays, since we have so many examples and variation of this in the Latin American cases. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to read that. OK. Let's see. And then, so moving to Ken's paper. Uh, so Ken seeks to address the same kind of important and troubling puzzle. Um, how, in a highly ideologically polarized and deeply partisan case like the United States and deeply partisan, did a populist outsider rise to power? As he points out, populist leaders typically leverage widespread popular discontent and target the entire political establishment to create new political movements, or at least ones that were historically excluded from politics, like in Bolivia, um, that uproot the system, establish weakened sorry, weaken established institutions and consolidate the populist's own personalistic authority. In contrast, Trump, while a personalistic political outsider, came to power through an established political party in a well-institutionalized system, in part by drawing on populist rhetoric that excluded large swaths of the US population. So what explains Trump's success and what impact will it have on US's uh, liberal democracy? So uh, Ken takes an organizational approach to explain this puzzle and its potential consequences 
um, and which rests on the evolution of the Republican Party and the interaction between the, support, uh, the, the mass and the elite base, and then between the party leaders and Trump. Specifically, he investigates the strategic choices, interactions, and alignments of the Republican Party before Trump and, um, and leading up to uh, the Trump regime. So he explains that the US started out as this well-institutionalized presidential system that had respect for nonpartisan institutions and those norms. Um, and yet, over time, both parties, but especially the Republican Party, have gradually transitioned from that well-structured kind of centrist position that competes for the median voter uh, to deeply polarized movements driven by conflicting social identities at the mass level. Uh, so reaching back into US history, uh, he illustrates how these divisive social identities became clarified and politically salient uh, during the civil rights movement. And since then, these divisions have mapped on to political parties. Um, so we have the Republican Party that has solidified itself as the party of a traditional white, largely Southern American heartland and Democrats who represent the party of Northern socially liberal elite, urbanites. Um, so the paper highlights valuable insights to be gained from both uh, historical qualitative analysis and comparison for understanding these complex social problems. His explanation of Trump's rise to power, as well as the comparison and really more the contrast of the Trump regime with other forms of populism worldwide, make this paper both convincing and troubling. Um, so some of the comments and questions that I had uh, first revolves around this concept of movement party. So it's really interesting looking at the devolution of the Republican Party from this institutionalized mess that helps sustain the structure and the norms into this um, hard to control movement party that's really driven from the bottom up. So what is, a, and, and I experienced this issue in my own work as well, what's a good working definition of movement party? Um, so you mentioned in your presentation here, it's a party of movements. And so perhaps it's, it's better to take this kind of more dispersed and plural, pluralistic in one sense approach. Um, but what is the threshold at which a party can be categorized as a movement party? So um, it's really interesting to see the, the, the progression through which this kind of happened in, in the US case. But if we were to look at this as a potential global concern, how do we know a movement party when we see it? And how specifically, by what criteria do we distinguish it from an institutionalized party, especially as this kind of backsliding and erosion creates this pretty big gray area? To me, it seems that the concept of movie, movement party contains two important yet potentially conflicting components. You have this socially mobilized base based on disparate or unified concerns and a charismatic or a personalistic leader with a populist strategy. Certainly, at least in the Republican uh, story, that seems to come later with, uh, with Donald Trump. Um, but what is the interaction between these two? And if that second kind of top-down component never comes, then what happens to, the, what happens to a movement party? Um, and then also, what will it take to set movement parties on a path towards reinstitutionalization? And I think this is the big question that you, you, you bring up at the end with these uh, three potential paths out. Um, but uh, it, it certainly relates to the latter two uh, to trajectories that you mentioned at the end of the paper, populist containment or aborted populism. Perhaps these are what reinstitutionalization might look like. But, um, but I was um, interested in knowing more about the Republican Party's role in shaping these two paths and, and where does that come from? And so does it depend on the leadership or does it, does it really depend on this kind of bottom up um, kind of force through that, that kind of toppled the institutional nature of the party in the first place? Um, then moving on, uh, what do the divisions between Trump and the Republican leaders suggest in terms of the polarization in the United States. So do these divisions stand to deepen polarization or do they stand to weaken it because of this tension that's going on within the movement party? 
So for example, would Trump's recent negotiations with the Democrats throw a wrench in the populist bandwagoning strategy or trajectory? Or is it too presumptuous to read these so-called negotiations as a sign of hope that the Republicans might be less willing to concede to Trump, given he isn't necessarily committed to their profound ideological commitments? And then uh, when you map out the voters, uh, the, the quadrants, um, the, the social and economic dimensions of who make up these, these movement parties. I think it's, it's really interesting how disparate the, the different um, ideas and, and, and ideological commitments um, they all have. And so how, how polarized are they really? And, and so when we look at the Latin American cases, we really need a cohesive base and, uh, and so how sustainable is it to have this kind of makeup that's, that's pretty diverse and uh, without a really strong and, and skilled leader um, at, at the helm, how much can, uh, how sustainable is, is that populist base for Trump? Um, so I'll stop there. I really enjoyed the paper as well and I think that it has some important very important insights for populism in this brand new setting of advanced democracies and how it arose. But with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end. Thank you very much. Caitlin has done a good job. Oh, by the way, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence of three graduate students from my seminar over in in the history department. Um, you're gonna get good marks this week. <laughs> and um, also on the way into the, uh, the conference this morning, of course I was stuck on Highway 35 for a good time thinking about these papers. And um, I just saw a sign in the distance that said um, repeal and replace. And I said, wow, the, the ladies club from, from the um, from the Freedom Caucus seems to be out uh, working popular opinion uh, today. But then I got closer and I read that it's repeal and replace Ted Cruz. <laughs> so there's, there is some hope even here in, Aust in Texas. Well, uh, the only thing I, <clears throat> uh, Caitlin has done a great job. I don't think I have to, to um, uh, give detailed uh, um, so, uh, comments on these papers here. I enjoyed both of them and they opened up my eyes in many ways. Um, but I'd like to uh, ask one question of my, my colleagues here in political science and that has to do with your concept of the aborted populism, Ken, uh, which is described here in your paper as the bulk of the Republican Party abandons the sinking ship. That's one way to kind of rebalance the, the power structure in, and the danger of uh, populism taking over the government of the United States. Well, there is something else too, and no one has mentioned this uh, yet this morning, and that is the 2018 uh, uh, elections for Congress and, and uh, also for governors throughout the state. And no one has mentioned this, but couldn't there be um, perhaps a kind of um, revival of democratic uh, voting patterns. And the big question for that seems to me to be, uh, will Trump's deplorables get out in the 2018 election and vote for Republicans without Trump being at the top of the ticket? So if you could uh, discuss that um, uh, briefly, that I, I would appreciate that. What I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit more about populism in the traditional sense in Latin America, going back to some of the greatest populists that, um, that have ruled and have given this uh, populism such a great kind of traditional trajectory in the 20th century uh, of Latin American history. And I want to talk about some of the characteristics uh, uh, taken uh, basically from this paper and also from my general knowledge of populism and the history of populism in Latin America. One is the idea of the weakness of democracy. That democracy in Latin America in certain countries had weakened quite a bit that populists could overtake it and kind of reimpose more authoritarian sorts of 
of uh, procedures and structures in, in the government. And, uh, and by the way, the populists always came to, to power basically through elections, largely because they appealed to um, the popular classes, which were, are, are always in Latin America much more numerous than the middle class and the elites. Um, in Latin America, it's tradition that the con uh, Congresses are weak. It's uh, traditional also that the courts are even weaker. So the balance of power between the executive and the, um, the other um, uh, branches of government are quite different in Latin America than they are traditionally here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> Also, I want to mention populism and the military, not a subject that has come up too much here, but it's well known that some of Trump's uh, secretaries uh, of, um, of, um, of departments are, in fact, uh, military men. And also within the White House, he has a number of advisors, too, who have military backgrounds. But in Latin America, the, uh, there is a, a, a very strong tradition in populism that military men uh, come to power as populists. Uh, the case of Perón, the case of Chavez, Torrijos in uh, Panama, Velasco in um, Peru in 1968 um, military coup d'etat, Cardenas in uh, Mexico in the 1930s, another great example of a strong military leader coming to power and then carrying out a kind of populist agenda. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about the military in Latin America is that the military can also uh, support non-military men in, be, uh, in uh, organizing a populist um, regime, largely because uh, the military in Latin America are not particularly defenders of the elite, especially the landholding elite in the 1930s. The, uh, the military men were just as susceptible as the middle class and even the workers of pointing out that uh, everybody else is down while the uh, landed elite control politics. So there is a kind of trend, uh, particularly in the 1930s, of the military supporting um, populist leaders who are not from the military, in uh, great cases, uh, Vargas of Brazil, coming to power with, with a revolution in which, um, against the old elite uh, politicians and the old elite parties, and the military joined them in this revolution in 1930. And it was a time of economic crisis, too, un unlike now, where we don't seem to have an economic crisis that explains the rise of Trump. Um, <clears throat> but the military can also end populism. The military can step in when corruption is uh, too, uh, too uh, outrageous. They can step in when the authoritarianism uh, reaches beyond its ac acceptable limits and by coup d'etat dump some uh, populist <laughs> presidents. Uh, staying with Brazil, the 1964 election that established a military government there for 21 years thereafter, in 1964 against uh, Goulart, who was uh, the heir apparent of, of Vargas himself. We don't have this in the United States. I don't expect this, gonna, this will be any way out uh, for uh, military men to step in if uh, Donald Trump follows his personal inclinations to do outrageous things in power. I, I believe, and I, I'm sure you will agree with me, that there are other means at hand in uh, US uh, political structures. Um, another thing about, the, about populism in Latin America is that it tends to be very uh, inflationary. In fact, I call uh, inflation the Achilles heel of populism, because sooner or later, populism in Latin America has been redistributive of income. So through the government, populists usually marshal income from various sources, uh, 
and then redistribute it to their populist followers to reward them for coming to the big rallies, to reward them for their votes. Um, Juan Perón was famous at this, and, and, and the others as well. So this is inflationary because uh, it assumes that, um, that the tax base will somehow be extracted, um, but most often it comes from printing money, or it has in the past come from printing money and uh, carrying over uh, deficits in the budget to the very next year. So all sorts of ways to get around that. Um, and we had a recent case in, in, in Argentina, once again, with the Kirchners, uh, always um, kind of downplaying and, and messing with the actual um, um, indications of inflation in the economy. Um, the difference here, it seems to me, is that Trump does not appear to be a distributor of income from the top down to the bottom. In fact, it seems just the opposite. And I'm wondering what the base is going to be like, the deplorables, uh, where, how they're going to react when they lose their insurance. Uh, through Obamacare, or even some sort of repeal that uh, kicks a lot of them uh, out of, um, of insurance assistance. Um, let's talk a little bit about corruption. Already there are signs, it seems to me, that there is some free spending in the White House and among cabinet members. Um, the recent thing about Price that, um, that just came out this week, uh, taking uh, private jets and corporate jets to various of his meetings, like five days a week, something like that, at great expense to the taxpayers, and also Trump using his own properties to profit from official business, going to... Uh, uh, entertaining at Mar-a-Lago, just to give you an example. Well, corruption also occurred among populists in Latin America, particularly when they were very powerful. And I believe that also this contributed to inflation and was in inflationary to a certain extent because um, uh, they were taking money and uh, spreading it out to their friends and neighbors. Even redistributive uh, programs were undermined by this sort of corruption that was expected among the close followers of uh, the leader. Perón, for example, had a big housing initiative in which he would build public housing. But who got that housing? It wasn't uh, the workers themselves, for example, but it was the workers' leaders. It was the labor leaders. It was people in his own administration. And that sort of, um, of corruption, of course, tends to undermine the populist uh, regime. Um, I could mention one other thing, and that is economic nationalism. Uh, in Latin America, economic, in, in, in my right that there are certain signs of economic nationalism in some of the programs and pronouncements of two minutes of, of, um, of Donald Trump. In Latin America, it led to uh, crony capitalism and it also led to uncompetitive production, um, very little um, com uh, competition with the outside uh, world and also high tariffs. So it uh, produced uh, shoddy goods for the home uh, economies, and it was also quite inflationary. Since I've only got two minutes, let me conclude with something close to my heart and a kind of comparison of um, Donald Trump and Fidel Castro. Probably Fidel Castro is the biggest, um, most uh, enduring, populist in all Latin America in the 20th century. Uh, neither of them ever apologized for anything. Uh, both of them 
demanded loyalty, but they were loyal to nobody. Um, both of them have their own realities. And this is one of the reasons why Fidel Castro sh slowly but surely in the early 1960s eliminated all other forms of inform information, all newspapers that were independent of his government, including some of the um, revolutionary papers <coughs> that touted the contributions to the revolution itself by other leaders, other revolutionary leaders and other revolutionary groups besides the M26 in the Sierra Maestra, Fidel Castro's own group. Is this what going to happen with Donald Trump? I don't know. The one thing we got going for us here in the United States dealing with Donald Trump is that uh, the, the great difference between the two, and I think uh, there's two differences between Donald Trump and and Fidel Castro. One of them is that uh, Donald Trump has a short attention span. And uh, Fidel Castro could deal with long range plans and wait for opportune times to bring them to fruition. This is why he was able to rule for um, 50 years. The second thing is that when he came to power, Fidel Castro was 32 years old. Donald Trump is 70. But it's not unusual that populists um, bequeath the presidential office to their wives. And uh, hopefully, well, hopefully this will not happen in the United States. Thank you very much. Let's open up the discussion. We have about half an hour, so people from the audience, step up, ask your questions. Yes, Tom. Comparatively, the, most, the largest difference between Latin American populism and American Trumpian populism is the absence of crisis. So if in Latin America you have a political, social, or economic crisis, and we don't see that in the US, to what do we, how can we explain that in the sense that th this seems to be more the result of a gradual cultural crisis of decline of trust in the American political establishment? So you almost want to talk about a cultural crisis because we don't have the conceptual vocabulary to, to explain what provoked the rise of Trump, the Dow is looking great, crime is reasonable, the price of milk is all right. Uh, there seems to be something else that's going on with uh, inequality and polarized identity politics and all of these things we come up with in the sort of Trump explanation industry. But uh, we still don't have one concept to be able to bring it about. And I don't know if cultural crisis would be too big a can of worms, but we don't have the weapons right now to explain him, it seems. I think your point is right on that what, one of the things that's so unusual about the U.S. case is that Trump is elected in a context of polarization of two strong, relatively strong, at least electorally strong parties. Usually we're accustomed in Latin America to populists getting elected in a context of very weak parties or collapsing parties. One thing, though, I think that partisan polarization is not always the same thing, at least not in the United States, as programmatic polarization and convergence. And one of the things, one area, one important area where the parties converged programmatically was essentially globalization. In both trade and immigration, the two parties had converged and Trump exploited that. Secondly, um, the, the, these questions, so we're, we're, all of us are spending a lot of time fretting about opposition strategy and you know taking lessons from Italians who had to put up with Berlusconi for two decades and uh, and Fair enough, you know, worrying about winning back 18 working class voters in Ohio. But there, there, there's a pretty important difference. The, the Democratic Party, in comparative terms, is in much, much better shape 
than oppositions in almost all of the other cases that, that we're looking at, whether it's Peru where the party system was collapsing or Ecuador was, where the party system went from weak to worse, uh, to Venezuela where the parties had melted down almost entirely, Italy the same thing, Hungary the, the Socialist Party was in disastrous shape. Uh, the, the Democrats are, are an even electoral kill with the, with the Republicans, if not slightly better. Uh, and Dan's right that they face some institutional obstacles, but electorally the Democratic Party is not in terrible shape. And so I think that should, that, that, that's an important difference. Because this seems remarkably unskilled if you think about what the base is. The one dip in your graph, which ended before this happened, was when he um, did the immigration thing and reached across the aisle. In a context of party polarization, that would seem to be about the most inept thing you could do. But there is a need for a broad coalition. And then just uh, an observation. Trump has surrounded himself with men of the military. However, they seem more loyal to the Constitution than he does. And on two very distinct occasions, the transgender thing, they said, wait, you know, it's not his role to just deem this, and we said nothing about that. And after Charlottesville, when they said, um, you know, the American military stands for racial integration. I thought that was uh, not so subtle but um, important message that the military sent. I was just going to ask one. But oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> so I have a question about gender. We haven't examined when women are populist, what kind of values and strategies they use to appeal to the population, how those differ from masculine populist leaders. So, uh, so I was actually going to ask a similar question the, to what Steve asked, because I also think that there has been a great deal of convergence um, between the Democrats and Republicans uh, uh, around economic policy, and, and, and Trump did exploit that. But, but, but let me ask a different question. So, uh, Ken, I, I agree with the general statement that uh, leaders of the Republican Party, um, that the Republican Party is key. Uh, first of all, for all this, and, and this makes the situation about populism very different in the United States from Latin America. Um, and I agree also with your statement that you know, leaders of the Republican Party are unlikely to, uh, to put regime interests over the interests of their party, but I do think they're much more likely to take put their personal career interests over the interests of the party. And so I think that's where there are actually opportunities, um, uh, the, there are incentives for Republican politicians um, to, to, to essentially try to block uh, Trump's initiatives. And there particularly, I think you're gonna see them in cases um, where they come from states that are evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats, where they're not just thinking about the Republican primary, but they're also thinking about the general election. And also in those cases uh, where they're unlikely uh, to run in another Republican primary. So, I mean, certainly John McCain, um, I don't think any of us expect him to, you know, compete again, uh, to run again uh, six years from now. So, um, so if you could just comment on those issues. A couple of, I will just pick some, some ideas. Um, I mean, first, I mean, th thank you very much for the comments, and I think they make a lot of sense from someone that has read uh, the paper from outside, uh, so I take many of these points. So one issue that you mentioned that it's interesting, for example, with the case of Color, and you will say, well, Color didn't success because of his own failure. And to a certain extent, it's true, but this is related to the specific specificity of Latin America. We are talking about populist personalist leader. When you're a personalist leader, you need to do everything by yourself to stay in power. You don't have a strong party behind you. So that's the key difference. And because he was not able to do it and to build a party, then he didn't succeed because of the problems that I pointed out. But this is where, again, the case of the US is so different. Because you have the president, he's highly incompetent, 
I mean, to a certain extent, but you still have the party supporting him. That's a big puzzle. And this is the key question, whether the party will stick to, to the president or not, and it's a bit the, the comment of Raul, and then you have all the calculations from the different part, people within the party. So, but this is also what, personally, for me, I think it's more worrying. And this is the development of, of the party, and this is why, before I mentioned Ted Cruz, I mean, he's a hardcore ideologue. I mean, if you think the ideology that he was putting forward, and this is the issue that I think we were discussing at the beginning, Trump is a populist, but he's also playing with other ideologies. And this is the argument of Kass, who will say populist radical right party is a combination of populism, nativism, and authoritarianism. And these two other ideologies are pretty important within the Republican Party, despite the issue of Trump being the president or not. And my impression is this is a long-term issue. Even if Trump will disappear tomorrow, these two other ideologies are within the party very, very relevant. So not only at the mass level, but also at the elite level, I mean. So and this is for me the, the sort of threatening scenario that I think it's not going to get away. Doesn't matter what is going to happen with, with Trump anyway. So related to the issue of the absence of crisis uh, in the case of the US in comparison to Latin America, yes. But think about the European cases. Do you know, I always put these examples at this, it's marvelous. The most voted populist radical right party in Western Europe is in Switzerland. 35% of the vote, Schweizerische Volkspartei. Switzerland, unemployment, economic growth, inequality. Objectively speaking, there are no reasons for that. But people are afraid and they are able to write, to develop the right frame to generate a sense of crisis. So it's not necessarily objective that the country is falling apart, but if you're able to develop the right frame, you will get a lot of votes. And this is what, uh, to a certain extent, happened in the case of the US, and if we add a real crisis that we were discussing before, then I think that might get out of control, so to say. And I think the key issue also with the US is and I completely agree with the argument of Steve that I was saying at the beginning. I think if you want to understand why is it that Trump became so successful, I think Trump is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, something is going on in US American democracy that it's not working properly. And because of that, then you have the rise of populism. And I think, generally speaking, when we think about the emergence of populist actors, it's normally because the democratic system is not working properly. I mean, there is a reason why people vote for these guys. It's not because people are crazy. It's because there are real problems with the democratic system, and I think that's what, to a certain extent, it's, it's going on in, in, in the US. Um, and finally, some small issue with what Ken probably will address, and this is the issue of convergence. And I think this is also part of the problem. I think, if you think about the, the, the Democrats and the Republicans, I think you see this issue of convergence at a certain programmatic level with certain issues like economic policies. I mean, the difference is not that big. And this is the same story with mainstream parties in Europe. If you want to understand why is it that in Switzerland you have a populist radical right party that is so successful, but in many other countries, it's because mainstream parties started to converge on the policy level, mainly on economic globalization. In Europe, it's much more on, on the issue of Europe. And because of that, you have many sections of the electorate that don't feel represented by the different existing parties. And then, no wonder, then you have a populist actor that is able to mobilize that sort of voters. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jonathan, for the, for the comments. You've given us a number of, number of issues uh, to make us think. And uh, Caitlin, in particular, you, you focused on um, you know, the question about what is, what do we mean by a movement party, and how would we define that, and how would we know when one, when we see one? And I think this is, one of the key questions, it's, it's something I don't really give enough attention to in the paper and, and probably would need to develop more perhaps going forward. But I think ultimately the conventional definition of that does not fit the Republican Party. I mean, it's a party that, that is basically created by movement activists and leaders and comes directly out of the movement. I mean, the Republican Party was that in the 1850s, but certainly that's not what you have today. But I think the transformation that I talk about has to do with the way um, in which not only at the grassroots, but even you know, working its way up now into the Republican Party uh, representation within Congress, you see more and more you know, congressional representatives who do come out of Tea Party uh, you know, activist networks or some of the other activist networks that are in the party. And what I think is crucial is that the, the party leadership clearly now between two, you could see 
they're losing control over the electoral basis of the party in the 2012 elections when you saw this extraordinary cycling of non-establishment you know, uh, candidates in the primary season. Remember, every two weeks, at first there was Michelle Bachman, and then there was the 999 guy, and then there was Rick Santorum, and then Rick Perry came up for a while, and, and they all just flamed, you know, they burned out, and eventually the bases accepted Mick, Mitt Romney, who clearly was not sort of the, movement, the movement's choice. Uh, so the, the establishment won out. But between, and, and we all kind of assumed, at least I assumed, at the beginning of the primary season, or before the primaries, when, when Trump came down that tower, um, and, and announced his candidacy and, and offended all the immigrants. And we said, well, you know, he's rallying support for a couple of weeks, but this will flame out like Michelle Bachman or something. And their staying power, you know, that you know, Cristobal <coughs> showed that the Republican bases have held true. And the fact, that, the fact that the party establishment had to rally around Ted Cruz as the primary alternative to Donald Trump tells you the, the party establishment has completely lost control of the basis of, of the Republican Party. And it's not just the Tea Party. There are these multiple currents. I mean, you're talking the, the base of the Republican Party. It's the evangelical churches. It's the Tea Party. It's the NRA. And it's white identity movements. And this is the core of the Republican Party today. And the party establishment does not control it. Now, all kinds of internal conflicts. If, in fact, Trump loses his appeal to the, to the voters, when will the elites really turn against him? It's when he becomes an electoral liability. And so if, if it looks like they're going to you know, get beat in 2018 or, or they're on to, you know, when he becomes an electoral liability, they will believe they certainly have, much of the leadership has no loyalty to Trump himself. And so they will abandon him if he becomes a liability. But what, I, what worries me is the ability you know, to, whether, whether they construct a crisis or, or create one or simply respond to one, but the ability to respond in ways that make it very difficult for elite defections, much less mass defections, to take place. And the ability to, to use some sort of crisis to unify the party across all of these conflicting strands. Um, the other point I want to just respond to, I completely agree about the, the questions about the programmatic convergence. I mean, the irony is that, you know, you do get this intense polarization, even though in many respects, especially when it comes to sort of, you know, global economic liberalism and uh, economic integration, the Democratic Party has basically accepted the, you know, what should be the, the agenda of the Republican Party. And the irony now is that you see the Republicans you know, under Trump moving towards protectionism, which is certainly not part of the ideological agenda. But I think that, in effect, it's, it's because of the fact that the two parties did converge around economic globalization. I think that is largely what has vacated that lower left quadrant, which I did, didn't show here, but is in the paper that, you know, in the two dimensional spaces of competition, that is that blue collar rural heartland vote uh, that, you know, is, does not clearly fit in the Republican or the Democratic Party, does not clearly fit in the Republican Party if the Republican Party is market fundamentalist. Once, Mark, once Trump re relaxes that market fundamentalism and is able to play some sort of economic card along with the cultural, is sort of the, the ethno-nationalist, moral traditionalist card uh, where there's a natural appeal, um, ultimately Trump was able to penetrate that quadrant in ways that, you know, that were decisive, I think, at, at the end for the election. Um, so ultimately, there, there has been some programmatic convergence, especially on, on, on economic policies. Uh, but in other ways, you know, the, the Republican Party, I think, has, you know, the strength of market fundamentalism before the rise of Trump within the Republican Party really does create significant programmatic space between the political parties, um, even if that isn't always recognized by, you know, in, in sectors of the electorate. But I think in comparative terms, uh, I used to compare the Republican Party to the UDI in, in Chile. They said that was the other political party on the right closest to the Republican Party in terms of sort of ideological orthodoxy. I'm not sure that the Republican Party doesn't outdo the, even the UDI in, in Chile, uh, you know, Pinochet's former political party. Um, so ultimately, uh, just a, a final point regarding the role of the military, uh, which, and, you know, Wendy raised this and Jonathan, I, it's striking that, uh, you know, how myself and probably a lot of others are almost reassured when Trump brings in military officers, which is, you know, when that happens in Latin America, we always see that as a sign that things are not good. And I think it is a sign that things are not good, that we would prefer that Trump turn to military officers 
um, as somebody that we would have more confidence in than people filling the cabinet who really come from the sort of the core ideological positions of within the party. Um, but I think it is, you know, and in some ways that's, you know, um, Trump reaching out for non-traditional kinds of political leadership, and it's reflecting the fact that he does not I himself identify with the party. You know, he has not filled his cabinet with people who are high-level Republicans. Um, he has, you know, and the high-level Republicans who were initially with him, he left them high and dry. Gingrich and, and uh, you know, um, the New Jersey governor, uh, and all of these guys were left, were left high, and, high and dry. Um, so anyway, this is, you know, he reaches out to, to other areas to try to define the leadership. Uh, and just a final point, Palomino, the, the gender question in all of this I find deeply puzzling and, and, um, and deeply troubling. Um, a majority of, of white women voted for Trump. Um, and given what Trump represents in terms of, of gender equality, I find that quite astonishing. But it's also quite indicative of how I think the other kinds of identities um, and issues have, have Trump gender. Um, and, and ultimately, we have to keep in mind that the Democratic Party has not won a majority of the white vote since the Civil Rights Act. Um, in the 1960s. Um, and, and so ultimately, I think race and other questions trumped gender um, in many respects within the election. So okay, I so better, quick, better stop about, there. About female popular candidates, sir. Um, very quickly, uh, I know Keiko Fujimori a little bit, and uh, she's actually a pretty mild mannered, nice person. She, she explained this to me. She learned very early on that she had to adopt a she had to become an asshole as, as, as a public persona to be taken seriously as a, as a female, sorry about the language, um, as, as a female candidate. Um, if she wanted to position herself as kind of a hard line, sort of make a kind of a populist appeal, she learned over time that she had to be, she had to invent a very tough persona for herself. That was her strategy. I don't know, I don't know, Christina. Because in the Latin American case, especially everybody is a man or a wife or a daughter. And I mean, even among scholars, you know, when we looked at the list of scholars who work on populism, so women, step up and, you know, tell us about this puzzle. Men step so. back, I think that's your point. <laughs> well, I, anyway. So um, we have time for another round of questions. I know you've all been shell shocked by Trump. You have been worried. You've been like brooding about this issue. Now is the opportunity to step up and ask the experts what you can expect and feel. Okay. Um, I would like to ask Christabel about the um, the international dimension uh, in your paper. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how that was effectively uh, implemented, so to speak, in the in the various waves, and and to the panel in general whether they think that. It, in any, at any point, uh, either Trump and his administration or, let's say, the, uh, the American political elite might be susceptible to pressure from abroad, and by whom then? <laughs> um, I want to, to insist in the military aspect. Um, the other day I read an article uh, which basically claimed that the appointment that really was um, like abnormal in terms of military in the cabinet was uh, retired General Kelly as chief of staff because it was not a security or a military defense appointment but rather a political appointment. So like thinking on, on military in political positions uh, which not, are not like directly related with the, the function of the military, uh, do you think that this could have an implication or, or there's like a kind of, of threshold that in other populist situations changes when military go into positions that are not like meant for, for military personnel? So I wanna pick up a little bit on this idea of, you know, what's the nature of the crisis? What is Trump saving us from? Um, and picking up on what Yasmin said in the last panel, which is it's, it's not necessary that there be an objective crisis, right? And, um, and so what is the nature of the crisis? If you ask the people in this room, there's no crisis, right? But 
but the people who voted for Trump, I think, have a pretty clear idea of what the crisis is. It's nothing less than the decline and decay of America itself, right? I mean, we're standing on the precipice. We're losing, you know, there's social chaos and disintegration in the streets. People are killing each other in Chicago, right? And we're losing our cultural and religious norms, the very norms upon which our country was founded. Um, there's economic malaise and a loss of global economic dominance. We're going downhill economically because we're giving away everything to foreigners. Um, we're losing our military dominance. Our very culture is being subverted by foreigners and by people who disagree with, I mean, everything is at stake. And, and so I'm not sure that we can sit here and say, Trump doesn't have a crisis to draw on. America and look at the places that were deep Trump places. You know, in the last few years, the level of opioid addiction has gone up like this. Very, very steep um, climb. I'm wondering if we're looking at this too much in the aggregate and if our definition of a crisis isn't pretty insulated from that of many people. So even without getting into the ethno-nationalist stuff, but just plain old daily life. This has been a long-term decline, but I see some signs if you disaggregate um, the the U.S. population, you wouldn't actually see some pretty steep indicators of a crisis. Pick up this thread, but that's what my presentation will be about this afternoon, so I'll hold off. Um, but I do want to, I do think that we're, in some ways, although we're in a comparative framework here, we're putting a lot of, um, uh, primacy on, on case-specific mechanisms in, in, in uh, the U.S. and not thinking broadly about what are the similar crises across cases that are generating the demand for the radical right in particular, uh, which is where the Latin American comparison becomes a little more uh, tenuous, but the European co uh, comparison, which we're going to hear about next, is going to be really important because I think there are actually similarities in the basis of support and the causes for radical right in Europe and the United States. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll hear about it this afternoon and the next presentation is in my own as well. Uh, but the, the other thing I, I wanted to ask about is that we talk, we, we've been talking a lot about the crisis of the Republican Party, but not a whole lot about the left. Um, and of course, in Europe, um, the crisis of the left is profound, and it's part of the reason for the rise of the radical right. Uh, I think it's true that the Democrats, I think Steve is right, Democrats are in somewhat better shape. Um, but there's still this question of, of what the Democrats can do. And it's a, it's a matter of a lot of disagreement these days about whether, you know, there's this kind of Mark Lilla, et cetera, argument about abandoning identity politics in favor of economic redistribution, um, which I think is a terrible idea. Uh, but there's this question of how you actually bring together um, issues of identity, which are hugely important in the current elections, with issues of economic redistribution. How do you sort of package that up together in a way that sort of offers a realistic social democratic vision for the country? Who is going to be the leader of that coalition within the Democratic Party? What is the right kind of response? And should we be going after the couple of thousand voters in the Midwest, or should we be actually offering a positive vision for the country as a whole and competing everywhere. And of course, another little piece of that, not little, uh, is what Tito Scotchpo and others have shown is that the Republican Party has been incredibly successful at replacing state legislatures and governors, governorships uh, with uh, partly through the Koch network and, and et cetera. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a basically a massive domination of politics at other levels um, beyond the federal by the Republican Party, which complicates this a lot because it affects the organizational uh, uh, mobilization on the ground. So anyway, just, just maybe we should talk a little bit about the Democratic Party, if, if possible, in the next 30 seconds. Let's start with the, with the last one, because it's something that also Steve mentioned. And here, I'm a bit less positive than Steve. It's always how you compare. I mean, of course, if you compare with Peru, where the whole party system collapsed, the Democratic Party is in much better shape. Shh, true. But my impression, it's a main problem of the Democratic Party, and I think this is an ongoing crisis of social democratic parties in general. I mean, I was like a um, couple of months ago in Berlin, and there was a meeting about how social democrats should do, and they were all happy about Macron. And then I say, like, if Macron is a social democrat, I don't know where do I live. 
I mean, uh, this shows that the elite of these parties are completely detached from the real problems of the people. I don't want to sound like a populist, but it's a bit like that. And I think this is a key problem within social democratic parties in general. And my impression that this is also a big problem for the Democratic Party. So how do you solve the crisis then? It's a long-term strategy, which means rebuilding the party at the programmatic level. And this means you need to rethink the sort of policies that you have put forward in the past or not. And this is a long-term strategy that I don't think that there is a, a simple solution for that. But I think it, to understand why we have Trump to a certain extent, also we need to look at the other side of the coin. And it's the same for Europe. I mean, it's, it's not only that it's one side that is going to explain everything. So going to the question of Burgeon about the, the international dimension, I mean, the argument here, and this is much more the typical argument when you have competitive authoritarian regimes. So these regimes, what they're going to do, it's are going to till the rules of the game in their own favor. So if you're in the opposition, it's going to get very tricky to build a strategy that is going to be successful. So what you will try to do is to reach also the international arena to put pressure on the regime. And I'm not saying that this is the only solution, but in Latin American examples, they have been very helpful because then you have the international arena for showing what the regime is doing at the national level. Of course, you might say in the case of the United States, it's completely different because it's a superpower. But this is, again, what I mentioned before with the case of Obama that for me is so tricky. To a certain extent, we have the rise of populist radical right parties in many places of the world. And Obama, to a certain extent, belongs to that. Sorry, and Trump belongs to that. So Obama would be the ideal candidate to say, we have a real problem at the global level, for example. And he would be a very good spokesperson for that sort of agenda. I'm not saying that he will change everything, but then he will able to pull like different actors at the international arena for saying something is going wrong not only in the US, but much more globally. And I think, I'm not saying that this is the only solution, but this might play a big role, particularly because the US is getting more and more isolated at the international level, I would say. Um, and going to this issue of what it's the nature of the crisis and whether we live in a bubble or not, I think yes or no, it depends how you see it. I always do, do the same. We had yesterday dinner and I asked Raul and Kurt, do you know someone that voted for Trump? And they told me, oh, yes, someone very, very far away. And I do the same with the scholars, and they don't know. I live in Chile, and I know people that voted for Pinochet and vote for Udi. So, but here, this is completely divided. I mean, we are talking about two different worlds. People read different media. It's completely, I mean, the level of polarization is extremely high. And this is the reason why we have, like, different interpretations about what is going on. So... Again, and this goes back to this issue that I think Trump is the tip of the iceberg. I don't think, I mean, he's threatening, but I think there are some, going, some ongoing issues in US American democracy that are seeing much more threatening than Trump uh, himself. Yeah, um, I, I think those are very important issues. And, and, you know, Wendy picked up on this, you know, this point as to whether or not there really are different realities. Uh, and in a sense, I think that's, you know, there's, there's a econ socioeconomic dimension of that with sectors of, of the heartland that have, that have been left behind that clearly has cultural significance as well that, that it taps on to some of the, the racial and ethnic divides. And, and ultimately, I think in, in some ways, if, to the extent that there's a crisis, and, and I think the crisis manifests itself in material ways, things like the opioid addiction and, and you know, declining social mobility, stagnant and declining wages for blue-collar workers, those kinds of things. So there's a material component of that that helps to create a base for the radical right experiments, not just in the U.S., but, but in Europe as well. But I think ultimately, we're, to the extent, even if, even if the macro level indicators of economic growth and unemployment and crime rates, I mean, you know, inflation and all of these ways, yeah, there's, there's no obvious national crisis. But I think given these rather separate realities and what that signifies is not just, not just a growing gap economically, but this cultural cleavage. So somebody asked before, is, is, the, is the crisis really cultural? But I think there's an element to that because to the extent that there's a crisis that, and, and to the extent that, that Trump has been effective at constructing a crisis, it's by sort of appealing to the, the, the sort of these, the notion of, uh, of social cohesion being threatened in some way. Um, and so there's a, a sociocultural element of who are we as a people, uh, or at least certain sectors that, uh, that feel under threat. And I think that there's, you know, those, in the eyes of those sectors, there's very much 
um, a crisis in the sense of social cohesion being threatened. And that's often the roots of, if, you know, Reed Hetherington's work in, on, on authoritarianism in politics. And that's, it's those threats to social cohesion that are really at the, at the core of, uh, of real challenges to democracy. And so my fear is that that's a, a lot of what you see going on. And I think a lot of this, to me, does have to do with the, the failure, the inability of, of some sort of democratic left in the US and in Europe uh, to appeal effectively to traditional blue collar working class kinds of constituencies in a context of market globalization and cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism and other kinds of things. There's a basic tension there. And if they don't find, if I think, you know, I fear that if they simply rely upon demographic shifts moving in their direction over time and don't find ways, you know, to, to, to reconstruct some sort of social fabric that would allow them to tap those other constituencies, I, I worry about where we're going.